Hey everybody, it is Romania Black, and we're on episode 7, 8, and 9 of season 2 of Ace of the Diamond. I'm so excited to be getting into season 2. Uh, I just checked the comments that y'all left on Patreon and YouTube for the end of season 1 and then starting out season 2 here. And yeah, Mukai is so intriguing. I like... I like the comment, uh, Kelsey and Zero kind of made comments about this, about Mukai's character, in that he's kind of like, if May, if May hadn't been humbled, and the idea of May being humbled is hilarious, but it's so true. The idea that Mukai is kind of like a, a more arrogant May, or a cockier May that hasn't experienced like a major loss at Nationals. It's kind of like... I guess comparing Furia and Sawamura, comparing Mukai and Mei, because they're similar pictures, but very different as well. So that's interesting. But yeah, I love the atmosphere of this game, that it's in the rain, like the idea of, we hadn't seen rain being used as a factor in all of um, season one with games. So I like that we're getting more into the environmental things happening with this. So interesting stuff. But yeah, I'm gonna get my note paper out here and get ready to talk about these episodes. I'm pretty excited. I, I like where season uh, two is headed so far. Uh, some of you commented uh, with my comment last episode that season four probably won't come out until 2023 if that's the case, just because of the, the manga content that's not caught up enough to be made into a season, which is sad. Um, it's very sad, but at the same time, I know I'm not gonna be satisfied with just this for Ace of the Diamond. I'm gonna want more content. So so I'm glad that eventually season four may get made. That makes me happy because I'm like, okay, I definitely, once I get through this season and season three, I'm gonna want more. So that's exciting, right? But yeah, let's do this. Where I am starting out, they put Sawamura in and he's been doing all right. I'm like, okay. Tato thought that they were ready for him, but he surprised him with the outside pitches that he's been working on through Chris. So I'm excited to see what all what all goes down. We have Koshu, our new guy that has been introduced into this series that will surely not be a major player later on, I'm sure, right? So with that being said, let's do this. Let's dive right in. I've waited all week. I've waited a full week before watching the, this episode, and I'm I'm ready to go. So with that being said, we're going to start episode 7 of season 2 of Ace of the Diamond here in 3, 2, 1, and let's go. Oh man, that ending of that game was so good. <laughs> so good! Ah, oh, man, I, I really... I was wondering if in episode seven, eight, nine, if we would if we would end the game with Taito, but I didn't think we'd end it already in episode eight. I was like, oh, okay. So episode nine was like its own thing leading into the next part. But man, I what I like about this series is that it does a lot of setup in this game, a lot of setup and then payoffs. And right off the bat, we, we've gotten set up with Sawamura, we've gotten set up with Zono in the last set of episodes, and in this set of episodes, Zono and Sawamura get payoff. And I love that. And Nori, Nori, my dude, I worry about Nori just as much as I worry about Sawamura, especially after the OVAs and everything. I'm like, dude, I, I do worry about him. I'm like, I was like, come on, you can do it, Nori. <laughs> I worry about him. I'm really glad that he got out of his funk in this set of episodes, in, especially in episode eight. Episode eight was wonderful. Episode eight was like just so satisfying because he, I, we're going to talk about OTI and talk about a lot of things. But so, so Faruya's, Faruya's emotions. Faruya is a hard character. I talked about this in the reaction, but him and Sawamura are so opposite characters, especially in how they express their emotion. Furuya is very hard to pin down in terms of what he's feeling because outwardly his facial expressions are not very nuanced. You don't get a very, you don't get to see what he's feeling really by his facial expressions. We saw the bags under his eyes when they lost against Inishiro and you can tell that he's frustrated, but he just kind of always has that like dazed and confused look. <laughs> like, especially when he is confused, he's like, huh? And Sawamura on the other end of the spectrum our sunshine boy is very easy to read. Like, you know when Sawamura's feeling something. You know when he's feeling happy or sad or mad. He's very expressive and emotional. And Furuya can be emotional. He's just not very expressive. So he's an interesting character. And I like that by the end of these episodes, Miyuki realizes that Katioka has big plans for both Sawamura and Furuya. He's not doing the Ochi strategy. He's not... I know a lot of people 
and myself included, kind of know that Katioka does. He gives Saomura a lot of the benefit of the doubt, but he believes in Saomura just as much as Furuya, and he wants them to become rivals and make each other better. And he's like, I know that if they work together and they have a healthy rivalry, they're going to make each other better players. And so he wants to keep fostering that because he wants them both to be amazing pitchers. That's the thing, right? Mukai. Mukai, man, the, the swing your bats and dance. I was like, ooh, I love it. I love it. Mukai, I honestly, he just kind of got wore out by the end of this, which he pitched over 120 pitches. Of course he did. Of course he got wore out. And I like that this these episodes showcased how Tato's captain, Okamoto, was wanting to do OCI strategy. His strategy is to raise Mukai up as an ace and having faith in him and letting him letting him pitch and fail to be better later on. Makes sense, right? And so it's going to be interesting to see if in this series it gets to a point where we see if that strategy necessarily worked or not, to see if that strategy worked. Um, the thing with Mukai's team is I don't think they're quite on Inishiro's level. Like you, you can raise up an ace like May because May's surrounded by players that are good enough to foster that, right? The strategy of raising up an ace, you have to, if you're going to do that risk, there has to be really good players surrounding that ace to kind of bolster them and be support and like a cushion for them. And Inishiro has that luxury of having players like that, whereas Mukai's team, with the exception of Inui, and which, which they went to nationals too, so they're a good team. But clearly Mukai was a kind of a foundational member of that. And Mukai finally has May moment. We'll talk about that. But yeah, just, I, I like the idea that if May and Mukai are trying to be pitchers that are shatterers of dreams, I like the idea that Haruichi is a shatterer of dreams like Raichi in terms of batters. I like the idea that Raichi and Haruichi are the batting version of a shatterer of dreams. Like it's like Haruichi just gets that gleam in his eye, the glitter in his eye as Salmer breaks the fourth wall and says, but he just like swings that bag and shatters it. And we're going to talk about them. But Zono, Zono, I was rooting for him since episode seven. I made notes about it and then came back around. I, in the last of episodes, Mukai struck him out. And then he got the pop fly in episode seven. And when he came back in episode eight, I'm like, I want him to hit it so badly. I want him to hit it. I was, oh, I'm so excited. But yeah, Mukai bold and meticulous. Yeah, Mukai is fearless. He's not afraid to pitch. He's not afraid to do the crazy pitches and to use the strike zone and everything. Like, he's bold and he's meticulous. He reminds me of it, and I was talking to Zero about this, and we were, like, on the same wavelength. But I'm like, he's kind of like if Shunshin was arrogant. If Shunshin was arrogant, that would be Mukai. Uh, if, if Shunshin was cockier. Because Shunshin's very, like, kind of like Miyuki. He's, he's more meticulous and... and intellectual about his pitching and Mukai has that strategy and that intellectual like the strike zone depth but he's just kind of cocky too and Shunshin's Shunshin's not really cocky so I like that idea um but also Miyuki throwing in the line of I like batters with I like pitchers with good control do you Miyuki do you have a type <laughs> Miyuki's type is pitchers with good control he would like Saomura to be his type <laughs> clearly um, I just, at that line, it was like, okay, show, sure. Um, but Koshu, Koshu and his friend. I don't know if we've gotten a name for Koshu's friend with the bandana um, or the headband, but they both are looking, They, I like how they both comment on Saomura and wanting to kind of, uh, the friend is a batter. You can tell the friend's a batter and Koshu's a catcher. And the friend that's the batter wants to experience Saomura's pitch from inside the box. And you can tell even though Koshu doesn't say anything that he wants to experience Saomura's pitch as a catcher. I'm like, uh-huh. And by the end of episode eight, we see that he wants to go to Sado. It's like, yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. So yeah, Saomura, I love that he's back in good spirits. I love it because there's that moment where Saomura messes up and they get the hit and he easily could have just gone down in the dumps. And I was waiting for it. I was like, if I see bags under his eyes, I'm going to freak because <laughs> we just spent the last eight episodes him getting over that. But he doesn't. But he doesn't. He does the Tomba strategy and he gets over it. He does the Sonata strategy. He gets over it. He's like, no, I'm good. It, it just happened. We're not going to let it ruin our, our funk. We're just going to go. And I was like, that's such growth for Saomura, for him to get to that point. Because everybody on the team was expecting Saomura to be down in the dumps. They were like, oh, it's okay. And even Miyuki's like, hey, let's switch gears. And like in mid-sentence, Saomura's like, nah, I'm good. It's like, oh. 
I like the idea of Salamura having the spirit of the ace. Like, even though he's not technically the ace that Furuya is, I love that Salamura has that spirit, that spirit to motivate his team and has that reliability to him. I'm like, yes. I want Salamura to eventually become the ace. I don't know how that's going to happen or, or when that's going to happen, but I'm like, Salamura has the, the spirit and the attitude that I think it's possible. And I love that. And the idea of perseverance that Katioka's like, persevere. You guys can do this. We can outlast them. Just get through this rain. Persevere. I love the rain as a like an environmental obstacle to overcome. So o Ochi, his strategy, and is basically being put to the test with Mukai here. And but here's the deal. I noted in my notes here that Mukai Mukai is not like Furuya in terms of stamina. Furuya struggles with stamina. He's our Goldilocks. If things aren't perfect, Furuya is a diva and he struggles. Mukai doesn't have that problem. Mukai's whole, he was arguing and boasting that he could outlast any of the pitchers. I really think he could. Mukai's problem is with the scenario, which we'll talk about in episode eight. That was where Mukai messed up. He, he got too ahead of the game. He got too ahead of the game and was predicting how things were going to go. And he, that caused him to make an error. And we'll get to that. But Mukai, I definitely think, has much more stamina than Furuya and could definitely outlast Furuya. So the idea of keeping him in an entire game, he's shown through this game that the weather doesn't affect him. It doesn't affect his stamina. He could outlast him. Right? But they also note, the reporters note, that Mukai is... He's very arrogant and set in his ways and stubborn because they're like, yeah, he's showcasing how powerful he is and how he could outlast the other players. But at the end of the day, he could pitch in a certain way that would lower his pitch count. He just doesn't want to change his style. He's so dedicated to it. And that's kind of a callback to, I mean, you can't blame him in a sense because that's a callback to Katioka getting onto Ochi for trying to change Sawamura's pitching style saying no he's got the style let him work through it it's fine so you can't really dog Mukai for for wanting to stick with what he knows is good and what works for him because that's kind of like if you say that's bad then saying that Salomura is sticking to the outside pitches or whatever is bad too so I get why I just think it's a funny note for the reporter to make like there are things Mukai could do to lower his pitch count and potentially keep him from making an error but he is dedicated to his style. He doesn't want to sacrifice that. So it's interesting to note. Um, Tojo. Tojo, man. I Again, I, episode seven, these episodes were great. Tojo getting the hit. I love the, the rivalry being set up between Mukai and Tojo, the two rivals from junior high. And I love that Tojo smacks it back in his face. Tojo being intimidating in this episode was wonderful because Mukai was kind of being snide with him in his head, being like, oh, you were like you were like a really good pitcher back in junior high, but now you've given that up and you've just settled for being a batter. Like, oh, I'll show you like how much better I am that I stuck with pitching. And I love that Tojo hits it. And then from the base, he's like, don't underestimate me. I've not given up on being a pitcher and I'm for damn sure going to give you trouble as a batter. And it's like, mm, I like this Tojo with a bite. Like Tojo's such a cinnamon bun, but this episode, him having that like pride and that bite back against M Mukai, I was like, mm-hmm. I really like Tojo as a character. I'm like all aboard the Tojo fan club. So I'm going to be like rooting for him this entire season. Him and him and a, he calls, he calls Kanemaru by first name basis, Shinji. They're like super friends. I'm like, do I ship them? Perhaps. <laughs> and then Haruichi does that uh, fourth wall break about, or Sarmura does about the, uh, the glitter in his eyes. And Haruichi's like, don't leave me alone. I'm like, nice. So yeah, I like the idea of setting up the cleanup being Tojo and Kuromochi, Haruichi, and Zono. I like that four batter cleanup. I like that idea of having those four batters back to back. Like that's really cool. And then after Zono, it's Miyuki. So I like the setup of that. I think that's a really cool dynamic that can be set up between all of them if they choose to, to pursue it this season. I liked that setup. And so then we go into episode eight. Zero to hero, man. As soon as, as, soon as Aso said zero to hero, I was like, oh yeah. Oh, Tono. Oh, Zono. I'm, I'm wanting Zono to just knock it out of the park. At that point, I was getting hyped. I was like, yes. And I was so ready for it. And th they do establish that, that Mukai and Inui are a fearsome battery because they are on the same wavelength. They are, they are what Miyuki wants to be 
with his bat with his pitchers. And it's what I think that if Miyuki and Shunshin had been in a battery together, I think that's what they have been would have been like. Because when we had Shunshin back in season one playing against Miyuki, Miyuki commented, he's like, he could just he could feel how Shunshin was pitching and he's like, Yeah, okay. And he wanted to be the battery with Shunshin then. I feel like if they had been allowed to, they would have been kind of like Mukai and Inui. And I like that Ukai and Inui are like like on the same wavelength. They're predicting each other's moves. They're so in sync with one another. And that uh, ironically, that leads to the error pitch because they were so focused. They had, they had won completely underestimated Zono. Mukai had been like, oh, you didn't hit my pitch at all the first time. You barely tapped it the second time. I'm not worried about you. That was mistake one. They underestimated their opponent. The second mistake was that they assumed that they had, they assumed that they could totally play him and get the pitch count that they needed. So he was like, oh, we'll just pitch inside to intimidate him and then we'll finish him off on the outside. Like they were, they were thinking a step ahead, but in baseball, like the reporter comments, you can't think a step ahead like that because what ends up happening, the third error being that because they were planning ahead and underestimating Zono, it allowed Mukai that in the moment he was a little teensy bit lenient with that inside pitch because he didn't think Zono would hit it. He's like, Zono's not going to hit this. It's, it's going to be a foul. He's going to maybe get a foul off of it, and then we'll finish him off with a strike to the outside. They were predicting too far ahead things that were outside of their control, and Zono completely took advantage of it. Bases loaded. And the other thing is, too, they were cocky enough that they were like, they were cocky enough as a team to be like, we'll load the bases and get the easy out and just crush their spirits. It's like, I, which in hindsight, yeah, looking back, it does make sense they wanted to load the bases. It makes sense they wanted to walk Haruichi because Haruichi has been shown to have a good batting response to Mukai's pitches. So they're like, it's kind of like when May struck out Yuki. May knew that he couldn't mess around with Yuki. He had to strike him out during that Inoshiro game because otherwise Yuki could hit it and it was going to be a, a big deal. And so it makes sense that in the moment, in the moment, Mukai's like, I don't want to risk Haruichi getting a hit while we have two people on base already. So I'll just walk him and then I know we can get Zono out. So that'll just solve the whole thing. So yeah, so yeah. Loading the bases was mistake one, underestimating Zono, and then thinking too far ahead and thinking too far into the future and not focusing on the present. That was the third error. And it caused that one bad pitch. And I love that line from the reporter. One bad pitch can ruin an entire game of good pitches. Damn, that's a line. Cause yeah, they were they were winning one to zero. They only had an inning left. If they could have just held them off the one inning, they probably would have won. But that one bad pitch undid all of Mukai's good pitching for the rest of the game and caused him to get three runs. Even Zono getting out, I was like, that was incredible. My dude, the scenario did not work like you thought it would. It was like, mm. It was so satisfying, so satisfying to see Zono get that. I was absolutely floored. But then, yeah. And then they left it. I, I like that, that Sawamura... You know, back in season one, when Sawamura had that moment where he tried to pitch inside and it didn't work and he got the bad hit, and the manager's in the background going, get Kawakami ready. I was like, ugh. But, yeah, it makes sense that now. I like that Sawamura was in good spirits going off the mound and letting Nori come in. I'm glad that he didn't let that get to him. He's like, okay, no, we're going to finish up with Nori. I was so glad that Sawamura wasn't beat up about that, that he was totally okay with it. I was like, good deal, great. But, yeah. And then... I was terrified that we had Nori come in and then it was they he'd allowed a run. It was two to three with two outs, and he was having the same issue he did with Inoshiro. In that moment, I felt so good about Zono scoring. I was like, Nori, if you mess this up, <laughs> I was gonna feel really bad and really mad at Nori. Because in the OVA, uh back when we watched the third OVA, we established that Nori has a lot of confidence issues. He's a second year and he tries to be reliable, but he has a lot of confidence issues. And when Miyuki goes up to talk to him and he points and you think he's pointing to the scoreboard, I thought he was pointing to the scoreboard too. I was like, oh, is he going to make a reference of how they're still up by one? It's okay. Nah, he was pointing to the sky and the fact that it had quit raining. The sun had came out and he's like, we got this. Like the rain's over. You're in your element. We got this. The, the weather's to our advantage. Let's do this. I loved that moment. I was like, oh, I was like, okay, Miyuki, you had a captain moment. You had a captain moment. It was great. 
top notch, all right, good deal. And then the sunshine came out and it was all over. I'm like, I'm glad Nori got out of his funk and was able to get that last out. And then yeah, Mukai had his May moment. The the messing up that one pitch, that was his moment. Because a lot of you had said that that Mukai hadn't been humbled yet. He hadn't been humbled by, you know, a moment like that. And this this humbled him. And so I like it. I like it. I like that Mukai now wants to work with Inui to repractice. Inui is only a second year, so they could both come back next year, which is really great. Um, and, and face them all again. I like that a lot of these players are just first and second years, that they're going to grow and develop and come back and play them later. I like it. But yeah, and then Koshu. Koshu having the moment of being like, I'm going to join Sato. And then it's like, yeah, I love it. I love it. I Y'all say that Koshu is edgy. I'm like, okay, an edgy catcher. I feel like if Koshu joins Sato, he's going to give Miyuki a lot of grief. <laughs> he's going to give... because. If you think about it, um, oh, uh, Hiraba, right? The the one, the first year catcher, he's very supportive of Salmura. He's very sweet and kind. And he's like, oh, he's really great. Koshu seems like he's going to be a little shit. <laughs> he's going to give Miyuki a lot of grief. And Miyuki's going to be like, what is your deal? <laughs> like, I, I, I'm honestly excited about it. But we will cross that bridge way when we get to it, right? And then at the end there, the, the idea of Furuya... Furuya being frustrated and that rivalry and Furuya and Nori both realizing that they still have work to, there's still work to be done and it's not just over, right? So w episode eight, there's a lot going on. Um, episode eight. So I love that Saomura emailing Wakana back. I, this, this show dates itself a little bit because they're emailing on their phones and his phone is like a little Nokia flip phone. It's kind of like free. It dates itself a little bit in the second season because those phones are like kind of outdated. But I've heard a lot of people in Japan still have phones like that. So maybe not. Uh, in the US, they're kind of outdated. But yeah, I like that he's emailing Wakana and getting caught up with her. And then of course, Kurumochi stops by and he's like, Wakana! <laughs> he's like, you're still emailing her, my girlfriend? <laughs> Uh, but Ochi, Ochi, oh yeah, again, Ochi doesn't see the need for subs to get better. I'm like, dude, I just want to like go and uh, smack him upside the head and be like, Ochi, I want to talk about Ochi a little bit in episode nine, but I'm going to save my, my thoughts about that. I did get really mad when he told Katioka that Saomura was crippled with the yips. I was like, I don't think he is. I don't think Saomura is crippled. I think that he has a problem with pitching the inside, but I really don't think that he's crippled by it. And I really don't like that he says that. And so I like that Katioka kind of comes back at him and he's like, no, he's like, I want to keep using Saomura and Furuya and Nori. He, he wants to keep using Nori because he knows Nori is good. Nori just needs to build his confidence back up and get better to play, you know, as a third year at the top of his game. But he's like, I know Furia and Salamura are going to be good players. They're going to be good pitchers. But they do best when they have a rivalry and they spurn each other forward. When they have a rivalry with one another, they encourage each other to be the best player that they can be. And he's like, and they do it to a healthy extent. I would argue in comparison to other sports rivalries, they do it to a really healthy extent. I like it. So I agree with Katioka that it's good that they keep on fostering this rivalry. And we not only see the rivalry with Saomura and Furuya, we also see, like, you know, Haruichi and Zono spurning each other on, Tojo and, and Kanemaru spurning each other on, but also Miyuki and Kurumochi spurning each other on, and Zono as well. Like, the idea of making Zono and Kurumochi vice captains with Miyuki just makes them spurn each other on and develop these healthy rivalries with one another that make them want to be better players. I like that. And then, yeah, and Ochai realizing that I need to step up my game because Katioka, maybe Katioka doesn't want to leave by the end of this game. Maybe if, if Katioka starts getting inspired by all these players working well and winning these games, he may change his mind about resigning and Ochai may not become coach anymore. And Ochai's like, mm, I need to sink some teeth in into the game uh, at this point. So I like it. I like it a lot. And then... Episode 9 was like a really, I always like 
in this series when after a game we use an episode kind of as a break and it's never filler. That's the one thing about the series. I'm sure a lot of people comment that the series feels slower because they take these episodes that are like time off between matches. I love them. They're some of my favorite episodes because they let the players breathe and we get character development. And this episode especially, there was a lot to talk about. Um, the idea that if, if, Inashiro wins this next round, and if our boys win this next round, they're going to rematch already? What? <laughs> I'm not... I just got calmed down from Inashiro's game against against Sato, and now you're telling me there's a chance they're going to face each other again in round three? <sighs> I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for that. No. No, no, no. So I love the third years. We get a little call back to them, and June's like, kill him. I give you permission. I'll allow it. <laughs> I like June is just murderous. And I also like that June, um, that him and the third years are like, how can we get back into the game? How can we, how can we trick them to get back in the game to play? Like they're still itching to play with them, even though they're retired. I would say out of all of them, um, out of all the players, Rio is the most likely to sneak in because Rio's like, I could totally sneak in and be, He's like, I could totally sneak in and pretend that I'm Haruichi. I'm like, with the right haircut, <laughs> I think Ryo and Haruichi are about the same height. I think they'd have the most chance of in, of him impersonating him. But yeah, not, not, not going to happen. It's just, I'm glad that we got to see the third years again. That was a good moment. Um, but yeah, so Nabe, Kudo, and Hiroshio. Those three. I was wondering if we would get, and I find the ties to Haikyuu, again, um, you have like Inoshida and the other ones that were second years that, that quit, right? Only they quit as first years and then came back to play. In this, we get, we get the three players that are thinking about quitting in this episode. And they were going to ask the captain Miyuki about it during the whole thing with the school trip. But Nabe, I, I can see maybe Kudo. At the end of this episode, I can see maybe Kudo and... Hiroshima or Hiroshio, I could see them quitting, but I don't know if Nabe is going to after that conversation with Miyuki. I think he might stick around. I'm not sure. But yeah. Um, so, Sawamura, he's quit crime and punishment. He's put down the Fyodor novel. <laughs> For a second, I was like, oh, is that a Bungo Stray Dogs reference? It is. It's Fyodor's novel, Crime and Punishment. He's put away crime and punishment. Sawamura is back to his normal self. Reading Your Lie in April. I, I've not watched Your Lie in April. I've heard it's sad, but I've also heard it's good. Um, but Your Lie, I'm wondering if that's just a reference to the manga. And I like that the girl manager's like, I have all the volumes of that series. Could me and Saomura fangirl about it together? <laughs> it's like, I kind of want at some point for the girl manager and Saomura to sit down and like have an otaku chat about, about um, a manga series. That'd be great. I would really like that. So Ochi is sinking his teeth into the situation. Um, getting the batting cages set up, the five batting cages. Here's my thing about Ochi. Um, I think Ochi is a good idea man. I think Ochi does present good ideas. And from the start of him showing up on the scene, I like the idea of Ochi presenting ideas to challenge Katioka and to make Katioka think about things and to bring new things to the table. Because I do think that Ochi has a point about. Katioka being a little bit maybe old fashioned in some of his training methods and a little bit outdated and that sometimes tried and true is good, but it's nice to bring new ideas to the table and to switch things up and to evolve. I like the idea of evolving, that Ochi represents the idea and the possibility of that, but Ochi is a good idea man. I don't think Ochi needs to be in charge. That's the difference. There are people in real life, in any scenario, that are good idea people that don't need to be placed in charge of projects. That they just can't do the right organization or the right gelling to make it all work. They have great ideas, but they just can't organize the entire picture. They need to be there to bounce ideas off and to present new, new things to be tried, but they don't need to be the person with all the executive authority. And I think Ochi is that perfect example. Like he makes a good assistant coach because he puts forth good ideas, but at the end of the day, there needs to be that main coach that can make the final ruling decisions based on the whole team. 
And Katioka says that. He's like, I don't want to raise just one ace. I don't want to put one player over all the others. I want to foster the entire team growing and evolving. And so he could use Ochi's ideas to help the team grow, but he doesn't want to let Ochi be in charge and have full reign. So anyway, and I like the idea in this episode that everyone, Kanemaru, others, they're all talking about their own weapons and what they can bring to the table to become better players. Like, I really like that. So Inishiro is going to face Ugimori. Ugimori, that's the team they're going to face. And Ugimori is being set up as a strong team as well. And Sato is going to face Nanamori. So we got two Moris that we're facing to, to get to round three. So I like it. I like it. We also get the name. I've been trying to think of the name of May's new catcher, and it's Tadano. Tadano, my boy, Godspeed. I'm sending a prayer up to you because you have got a long road ahead of you. Like, May is not making it easy. May is like, you'll one day get up to Harada's level. Maybe one day you'll be good enough for my pitches. And it's like, you can just tell Tadano is like, I am done with you already. <laughs> God, just, he is pride as a catcher. And so I'm really, really looking forward to see how the May Tadano battery shapes up. I, I can see the potential of Tadano to become a great catcher like Harada. I think he's got all the, the mindset there. It's just he has to prove himself to May. And that's the worst part because May is such a diva. So we got the name of the crazy haired guy with his hair is like out to the side. Also is his name. Um, we got that. Um, we got the idea of Furuya being Furuya wanting to improve and get back on the mound again. We've got that. And then Miyuki's conversation with Nab with Nabe. Because Miyuki wanted him, Fuki, Miyuki wanted Nabe to watch the Inishiro Ugamori game and take notes and take score. And that's when they have the conversation. And I like that Miyuki tells him straight up. He's very honest. He's like, I can't stop you from quitting. He's like, we pay we play baseball for ourselves. Like at the end of the day, yeah, we do it as a team and it's a team sport, but we're here because we want to be here. He's like, you don't just do all this practice and do all this crazy regimen and training for any other reason than that you want to be here, right? Miyuki's like, at least that's how I see it. So he's like, if you want to quit, if you don't think you can commit, then that's fine. And Nabe keeps saying that's not it. So I'm like, okay, does Nabe... I think maybe Nabe's just worried. He's like, should I quit because I'm not as dedicated as you all are? Maybe that's it. Maybe him and the other two guys are like, we don't necessarily want to quit, but we don't think we're putting in everything that we can like you all are, and we don't know if we'll ever get to that point. So that's interesting, and I kept wanting them to talk about it, and then, of course, Sal Moron, <laughs> him and Free and them have to break it all up, you know? But we don't see Nabe again. We see the other two. We see Kudo and the other guy. And they run into Zono and Saomura practicing late. And I like that Haruichi sets up that Zono has always been a Saomura supporter. And I'm like, yeah, because Saomura is kind of an underdog like Zono. So, of course, Zono would support him. That makes a lot of sense. But then again, yeah, um, Furuya thinking about, like, pitching to the ceiling, it reminded me of, it reminded me of Hinata and Haikyuu doing the lonely volleyball drills, the lonely received drills. Furuya just tossing the ball up to the ceiling. And Furuya and Hinata are kind of similar in that Hinata never really had a team to practice with in middle school, and neither did Furuya. That's funny. Actually, you know, if we if we compare to Haikyuu, Sawamura is not like Hinata. Furuya is more like Hinata. Furuya is Furuya is Hinata with Kageyama's attitude. <laughs> he is Hinata with Kageyama's personality. Furuya is the love child of Kageyama Hinata. <laughs> Oddly enough. <laughs> yeah, because he has the, he's always been a loner, but had talent like Hinata. He just didn't have anywhere to hone it until he got to the team, right? That's interesting. Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that. But yeah, um, Saomura thinking that he was in trouble going to the the manager's room, thinking that he, he in fact stayed up too late till like 2 o'clock in the morning and then slept through class and thought he was in trouble. But no, um, and then there's that final conversation between Ochi and, and Katioka and Miyuki being like, are you punishing Furuya by making him not start the game? And Katioka's like, no, I want Furuya to prove that he is the ace. Here's the thing. Whenever Tamba was not playing on the mound, Tamba still had the power of the ace. He still had that aura about him. He could still influence the team and motivate the team 
as the ace even when he wasn't pitching. And Katioka almost seems like he's challenging Furia to do the same. He's like, Furia, can you still have the attitude of an ace even when you're not starting the mound? Can you do it? Because as we've seen in these last two episodes, seven and eight, Salomura, and he comments to Ochi about that. He's like, I went with Salomura because he had the right mindset and the right attitude in the moment to go in and do what he had to do. He had the spirit of the ace in that moment. And he's like, I want Furuya to have the same. He's like, I've got plans for Furuya and Saomura together, and it won't work if one of them's not ready. So I like that. So we've never started a game with Saomura, to my knowledge. Uh, Y'all probably comment down below. I mean, this is, we're into like the 60s in terms of episodes, but I don't think we've, or no, we're in terms of like 80s and 90s in terms of episodes, right? We're in the 80s at this point. Um, So I don't think in 80 episodes... (laughs) We've ever had Salomura start a game. So, first time for everything, right? <laughs> but these episodes were so good. They're, they're so good. There's so much to talk about. So, I love our comment section for these episodes and for this series. So, I can't wait to talk to you all about these episodes. But, yeah, um, I'm really excited to see what goes down in episodes 10, 11, 12 with our game against, our game against Nanamori. I'm curious if we're going to go back and forth between Nanamori and Ugamori's games with each team. I'm curious if we're going to go back and forth with that. But we shall see, won't we? So, in the meantime, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this reaction and these episodes. I can't wait to hear your comments down below. But I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and I'll be back soon with more Ace of the Diamond. Bye.